Radio. Coming up, the fellas get back on track and return to the list with 2006's Days of Glory. Don't confuse it with Paths of Glory or Days of Thunder. You might end up looking like a monkey fucking a football. Oh no, off track already. Pull it together, announcer man! As France is occupied, three French forces enlist the aid of the natives of their many colonies. Patriotic men, never having seen the country they are to fight for, quickly realize that liberty, equality, and brotherhood are the purview of the white French. All this and a real bummer of an ending this week on For Screen and Country! Yes, hello, ladies and gentlemen, all listeners of all genders and all ships at sea. Yes, welcome to a podcast called Four Screen. And Gundry, and I am a host named Jason. And I am a parasite named Brendan. That's right. And together we are a naturally occurring twosome that is uh, here to digest movies of a warlike nature. Brendan, we are yes, coming par- to our fans today live from Marseille, France, the beautiful coast, the south coast of France. It is warm. It is beautiful. There are lots of ladies walking around smoking cigarettes, wearing berets, and eating baguettes. It is fantastic. Over to you, Brendan. Well, I was just going to mention that uh, after that intro, it sounds like uh, something out of a body horror film. <laughs> Apparently, we are the David Cronenberg of podcasts, babe. That's right. But But we are not the David Cronenberg of podcasts. We have watched (gasps) a David Cronenberg movie. Well, we kind of are. We're in the sense that we're Canadian. That is true. That is true. I guess we are the David Cronenberg of podcasts. And we're gross. Extremely. Extremely. (laughs) If you you saw the video of this, I guess, yeah, you would have your own Cronenbergian experience. I mean, we're just inserting videotape after videotape into our guts. Yeah, <laughs> it's a lot, lot, lot of gut videotapes, but you know what? It's how we like to live, and we don't like being judged. No, we don't like being judged. Well, I don't mind being judged. It's kind of one of my kinks, but Jason doesn't like it. I don't like it. So that's why I've come to the least judgmental place on the planet, Marseille, France. The French, of course, the most loving, accepting people that have ever existed. I, I thought you were going to say that's why you came to the most accepting place on the planet, the World Wide Web. <laughs> <laughs> yes, everybody everybody on the web is so nice. If you just want to talk about soccer, there are lots of people to talk about soccer. If you want nothing but positivity, come to the internet. <laughs> that's right, where information wants to be free. Uh-huh. But freedom but isn't free. Freedom isn't free. And in fact, that leads into our uh, uh, next uh, uh, establishing fact, which is that we're doing a podcast about war movies, specifically those war movies listed in Paste Magazine's Top 100 Best War Movies of All Time. Mm. Yes. And this week, Brendan, we are diving into something a little different from what we've seen. We've seen a whole lot of whiteies in the mm. course of our uh, in the course of our movie watching and too many is, you could argue too many perhaps i mean certainly there was a lot of them during a lot of wars uh, but we're going to actually going to deal with a subject that i don't think we've actually really dealt with yet which is colonial troops and mm. of course as people coming from a country full of colonial troops hello however most of ours were white so they probably got better treatment than a lot of the others but what we're here mm-hmm. to talk about is the 2006 film called days of Glory, which deals with a group of folks that join up with the 7th Algerian Regiment in the Free French Army as they attempt to liberate France from the dastardly Nazis. 
Yes, Days of Glory, released in the year of our Lord in 2006. Mm -hmm. Uh, This movie is directed by Rashid Bouchereb, and I probably am butchering that name, the pronunciation. I apologize if I am. Mm -hmm. Um, Jason, normally I mention a few other things people might know that he's directed, but honestly, um, I don't know. I'm very uh, un... um, unskilled in the knowledge of the the filmography of this particular director um and i don't really know a whole lot about the uh the cast but i will name some of them we have uh jamel debouze as saeed uh, uh, we have apparently Sammy. a apparently a very well-known uh, comedian and improviser in his home country uh i uh, or, of france i guess i don't know if that's his home country but I've, I I heard that many of I read that many of them uh, in the cast were known more for comedy, which huh. is uh, pretty crazy when you find out what this movie is. Um, we also have Sammy Nasseri as Yasser. Uh, we have Roshdi Zem as Masoud. Uh, Sammy Bujila as Abdel Kader. Now those are like I'd say the four like main dudes. Yes. And then of course we have a uh, very complicated and interesting character played by Bernard Blanken and that's Sergeant Roger Martinez. Yes. And I'm going to mention she doesn't have a big part but Jason we have a lady Orly Eltvet as Irene. Oh, that's right. We did have a lady. We do have a lady. We have several well, ladies. Two ladies. The most prominent lady. Sa- Saeed starts uh, 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 being friendly with that milkmaid near the end of the movie. Mm-hmm. And not in the way you think. Oh. I don't know what that means. Jason, I'd be remiss. I forgot to mention uh, you might know uh, Quentin Tarantino fans or fans of Inglorious Bastards might want to know that Melanie Laurent is actually in this movie. She has a brief role. I don't know who she plays. Uh-huh. Uh, well, I, I should say I don't know who she is in the movie, but she is credited as uh, Marguerite Village Vost, whoever that character is. But Melanie Laurent, who plays Shoshana in Inglorious Bastards, is indeed in this movie at some point. Cool. Yeah. We'll talk more about her when we get to that movie. Absolutely. Back to you, Jason. Yes, yeah, so so this is Days of Glory, as we pointed out. The actual original title in French translates to natives, in, mm. indi- indigene, which sounds similar to the English phrase indigenous. I maybe I get why they changed the title from natives, because that has a different connotation over here. Um, yes. But, uh, yeah, this is about a, 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 well, focusing on Saeed initially. He's kind of the, the first character we encounter. He's a, a poor goat herder living in Algeria, which is one of France's many colonies in Africa. And uh, uh, the word comes down that the war is on. At, well, I mean, the, I guess to be fair, the, it's not like these people are living in the middle of nowhere. They knew the war was on. But the fact that they were like the Free French Army was coming and getting together and raising you know, and, and, and unifying with the uh, colonial forces and getting ready to like get involved in the fight to liberate France from the Nazi occupation. No, nope, uh, you had it right the first time. In 1943, they all found out that there was a war going what? on. What? So Saeed, and this is interesting, is that Saeed is like, yeah, I want to go. I mean, obviously, it's it's partially he's a, he's a goat herder. He's not doing anything. He's young. He wants to get out into the world, right? But he seems to have a legitimate desire to defend France. And all that's the thing about all these guys going into this. They all are going in with patriotic... In intentions, maybe not so much um, uh, Yassir and Labry, uh, because as we later learned, their parents were killed by French people. Um, in, uh, 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 Are you talking about Yassir and Abdel Qadar? No, no, no. Uh, Yassir and his brother. Uh, oh, sorry. Okay. Because they're, they're like, the two of those guys are more like, they're like tribesmen, I think. Like. Mm-hmm. They're because they're still wearing their kind of traditional outfits and sandals and and uh, head wraps and stuff uh, in combat. But and yes. they're going specifically. He's I guess yes, he's going because he wants to to get some um, um, booty to sell for money to be able to pay for Labry's wedding. Is that his name, Labry? I think so. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so we got them, uh, and then whereas then we've got like a- Abdul Qadar is a he's a guy that can read, he's literate, he's uh, seems to be a little more educated than the other guys, and he's the corporal, so he's kind of in well, charge th- of their squad. I think Saeed is the only one that specifically pointed out as illiterate, though. As illiterate, yeah, okay, but but Abdul yeah. Qadar is the guy that's like reading the fucking military manuals and stuff. Y- like, yes, he's- he he's very educated, and he's also constantly at odds with another interesting character, Sergeant Roger Martinez. Yes, Martinez, who's a French man. 
He's a he's a he's the French guy in charge of the unit because, of course, we have to assume that they would have French people in charge. But he's not totally French. In the course of the movie, Saeed uh, takes a position, basically, as his steward, where he's um, you know he gets his shirts ready and everything. Like it's a privilege of rank, right? In a lot of militaries, mm-hmm. um, and he finds a picture of of Martinez as a child with his mother, and it's clear his mother is an Arab, and. As I understand, I, I went and looked into this, and he is what is known as, uh, he would be what they know as P.A. Noir, which I think literally trans, mm. translates to Blackfeet, but it's um, French and and uh, locals that married and had kids, and their their children were P.A. Noir. And as you can see, like, he's he has, he speaks perfect French. He kind of has that, he like, his he looks very French in the sense that he's kind of skinny, and he looks like he smokes a lot, um, but he's, he's also, also really swarthy. He's got a very dark mustache and very dark hair and kind of brown skin. He's also very clearly trying to hide that fact that he is not just which a, is, a pure Frenchman. Which is a fascinating little thing that I didn't kind of think about until now. But French culture has, as I understand, and, and I'm no expert, so if there are any French French people listening, not Quebecois French, we don't want to hear from you on this matter, guys. Just we don't hear from you relax. at all. Oh, no, well, I'm happy to hear from them. Remember when we talked no. about Les Ordres? Um, but nope. uh, if there's any French French people, I feel like France has kind of... so. France is kind of uh, Republican history, this idea of liberty, equality, and fraternity. The idea that it's a, it's kind of similar to the United States where it's like, it's more the idea is that it's a melting pot, right? And, and that the idea is, is that you assimilate into French culture. You don't, it's not necessarily a multicultural society where different cultures kind of like exist and mingle. It's like there's French culture and you become part of it. And it seems like Martinez is being a guy that is trying to do that uh, so that he gets treated as he believes he should be treated, which everybody should be treated as, as an equal. And that becomes mm-hmm. a theme of this movie is because these colonial troops, clearly, despite the despite the red, white, and blue on the flag, despite the liberté, égalité, fraternité, that it's, you know, it's fucking, it doesn't matter. They're not French people, quote unquote. They're not white French people. I mean, to the point, Jason, where we're literally shown in the op- in one of, in the first attack scene in the movie where they're sent in, they're fired at by these artillery uh, by this artillery, by the by the by the Germans, yeah. and when we go to the top of the hill and see uh, the 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 white French troops standing there, they are cl- they have clearly designed this mission just so they can find out where the artillery is coming from. Essentially, using a lot of these people as cannon fodder. Yeah, exactly. I mean it's it's pretty like they're not trying to hide it. <laughs> no, no, and they're not they're not using, of course, white French troops. No, that's what the colonial no, no, troops no, are no. for. Certainly. Sir, no, 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 no. But I mean, no, they, no, no. They th- that first attack though is interesting because like everybody, it's kind of the blooding for everybody, right? It's their first battle. Um, during training, Said had an incident where he accidentally pulled a grenade off his jacket and pulled the pin off it. Um, mm-hmm. And then they and then Martinez had to fucking grab the thing and huck it away, hoping nobody was nearby, and he ended up blowing up a tent with it. Now, normally that would be the thing that would probably get you like ejected immediately, maybe sent to jail. Uh, in our war, y- you can't afford to be picky. And also, he's a colonial. Who cares, right? So well, but Saeed makes think... up for it by grenading a German machine gun nest, of properly pulling off the grenade, tossing it, yeah. and blowing it the fuck up. It also kind of alludes. I mean, it kind of ties in with the repeated thing that we we kind of see throughout the movie is that some of these guys are, are quite good, but a lot of them are not properly trained, obviously. Like, they come into this wanting to, you know, fight for France, but it's not like the white troops are going to go out of their way to give them the proper training and expertise with their weapons and make sure they they know all they need to know. I mean, it's not ha- it's not going to happen. Hmm. Right? I mean, that's just a sign that that's what's happening because he, yeah. like, literally pulls out their pin of a grenade and then just stands there. Yeah. I mean, clearly there's no, there, no one came up to him and said, this is how you throw a grenade. That's it. That's it. And and Martinez is doing the best with what he has because he clearly, like, Martinez is a guy that does give a shit about his unit. Um, he, he is hard on them, but he, I mean, we do have that moment uh, a little bit later on where uh, they're on a ship. And they're going for dinner, and one of the black African troops goes to grab a tomato. And the, and the cook tells him, no, it's not for you. He goes, what do you mean it's not for me? Why can't I have it? He goes, it's not for you. 
and and uh, you know then that you know like uh, Ab, Ab, Abdel Qadar and and uh, Mesamud and everybody they're like well why can't we have them we want them and so it becomes a whole thing they're ready to mutiny on this ship <laughs> because they're like oh you, the colonial troops don't get uh, tomatoes so mm-hmm. they have a meeting with the colonel and the sergeant and everything and they finally decide okay you guys can have tomatoes which seems like a very practical in the moment uh, response because well, they and, don't and- want a mutiny. And of course, like Abdel Kader grabs the entire barrel and stomps on all those. So no one gets tomatoes. Yeah, no one gets tomatoes. And again, well, case, they, they keep hammering this point home. They're like, liberty, equality, equality, brotherhood. Like, we're part of the French too. We're fighting for France. We've never been to France. We are fighting for France because we are patriots. And this is how you treat us. Like, so can we talk about then, because we talked, we mentioned him a few times already, but let's talk about Sergeant Martinez because... It is a very interesting character. And like you said, he, he seems to care about his guys. He seems to go a little hard on them. Um, I, I like that he's that it's a conflict. It's a, it's a difficult character. It doesn't let you fully sympathize with him because there are moments where you're like, oof, man, oof. Yeah. Um, but then there are moments where, you know, they say, uh, they talk about like, well, what do we do about the in, about the indigenous uh, soldiers? And he's like, no, come on, the, they're not they're not all like they're not in, necessarily indigenous. He's like, well, what about okay, the Muslims? He's like, what do you want me to call them? And he says, just call them the men. Just les hommes, just yeah. les hommes. That's it. I, I should mention yes, the entire movie is in French, but yes. I'm not gonna quote well, all of the uh, French lines in French. I'm French- sorry, and I I regret nothing. It's it's French and Arabic. Yes, but I'll, I think. For the most part, most of it's, it's in French. Usually, French. when usually when the the kind of four core guys are talking to the, each other, they'll be speaking Arabic. I don't think that Yasir actually even speaks French, or yeah. at least he he knows a little bit, or maybe he does speak French at one point. But, you have to know at least enough to be in the military to understand the commands. Yeah, but there, okay, so there's that aspect of of Martinez, but then the other side of it, um, I'm just gonna spell the word W O G. It's a slur for someone yeah. who's not white, yeah. but he uses that when he says this kind of person is uh, uh, this kind of person cannot be a leader. When he when yeah. Abdul Qadir is really getting in his face and confronting him, and he says that to him. Now, there's part of it that's like, okay, that's a heated in the moment response, but it's also like, where where do where do Martinez's true feelings lie? We never really know. I don't think. I don't think we know if he's like. Uh, if he if he thinks a particular way about a certain group of people, because no, I think I think because he is so committed to leading the men to victory and just doing what needs to be done, that any part of him that thinks one way or another about that is in the background. But I think in that scene, it kind of comes out a little bit. See, I, so I, I don't know. I'll tell you, I read that scene a little different. I when he says that that type of that slur can't be a leader. I think what he's saying is is that he's acknowledging that he is one of those. He is a a a pied noir. He is a person with an Arabic background. And by saying that, he's confirming the idea that I have to hide who I am because I can't be a leader if they think of me that way. Okay. Well, I don't know. Because I, I, because he's because he, what I'm saying is he's hiding the fact that he's Arabic so that they won't think of him in this racial way through a racial slur and pigeonhole him. If they think of him as yeah. a Frenchman, he can be a leader. But if they think of him as a slur, he can't be a leader. So I just thought that was him telling Abdel Kader he could never be a leader. See, and I, doing I, it I in the way that but that's the thing. I don't believe that. I don't believe that he's that he actually thinks that Abdel Kader can't be a leader. I'm not saying that he com- maybe completely believes it. Mm. What he's saying, it might just be a heat of the mo- like a heated moment yeah. that that kind of stuff comes out. Unfortunately, it was the style at the time, as Grandpa I mean, Simpson likes to say. It, it could but, even be it could even be him saying like, "Look at me, I can hide who I am, but look at you, you can't." See, I don't. I didn't catch. I didn't get that out of that. And that's why we're different people, Jason. That's right, and that's why it's fun talking about movies with each other. <laughs> And then, and then the whole thing, like you said, where he's he because he takes Saeed as sort of like, uh, I mean, his assistant, I guess. Yeah, Stewart is. I, I think, Stewart. yeah, he, he basically, yeah, he irons his shirts, he gets his meals for him, his coffee. Like it's a, it's a, you know, it's a job in the army. And yeah. It's it's a a little bit of an honor, I suppose, if if the if the sergeant has enough, uh, 
uh, faith in you. Although this is interesting that in the French, mil- maybe this is just, it goes way back cause it's an old military, but like the idea of like a non-com having a steward, like I get the idea of like a Lieutenant or, you know, like, like a, uh, even like a much higher ranking officer having a steward, but the idea of a Sergeant having a steward, like sergeants are sergeants are enlisted men like the rest of them. I mean, maybe there's a different culture in the French army, but you know, it seems I a little don't... bit lottied off for a Sergeant. I know nothing of this topic, so I'll just agree with you because <laughs> I don't know. Um, but w- what I was to say is he he takes Saeed kind of shows like a kind of personal interest in him. I mean, he even seem seemingly is going to help him learn how to read. And uh, the moment that kind of, it was very, by the way, very akin to the movie Che. Remember that? He taught yeah. his men how to read and educate yes. them. Um, but, but. The moment that he the the script is flipped, I guess, is when they're having like you you mentioned this earlier when they're they're sitting together, and Saeed mentions that his um, uh, that uh, uh, Martinez's mother was I think mother Martinez's mother was Arabic is what he says right yes yeah because and he had he, found the because he had found the picture in his shirt pocket while dealing with the shirts yeah and he goes completely apeshit and you think like okay he, uh, it's under the guise of don't look through my stuff but yeah. obviously it's really i don't i didn't want you to know this about me because i'm trying to hide it and now he's got to worry about someone else potentially accidentally saying something to yeah. to you know a white soldier mhm mhm um and, and then, of course, there's that telling scene where he does get his promotion, Martinez, and the guy who gets promoted to sergeant, we see throughout the movie, it should be Abdel Kader. Like, it yeah. should be him. And it's this white dude who really is kind of a non-factor in most of the movie up to that point. He's a nice and guy, they, but he's, yeah, he's, he's not really doing it. He's just there. He's fine. But, like, the you know, the colonial troops just kind of look at him and go, huh, and then walk away. Like, it's like, really? That guy? Okay. A guy that they don't really know or have any loyalty to. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, no, he he is. It is very interesting. It's almost like it's. It reminds me a lot too when we talked about uh, City of Life and Death. And you, it's interesting movies that choose to have the one character on. You know that you would normally it, it associates with the villains or like not maybe not the villains but you know the aggressors or whatever, and. Some filmmakers, they do this. They have this one character that's there, but sort of isn't really there. You know, like they're kind of in between. And we saw that, at, like I said, we saw that in City of Life and Death to a different extent, obviously, a mm. uh, different extreme. But it's the same idea here where and I think this is I think this is when filmmakers are like, we don't want to necessarily demonize everyone on the white French side. So we're going to have a few of them that are kind of cool and, and decent to be around. And I don't think there's ever like. I never got the sense that they were cartoonishly racist. No, no. You just get I mean, the there overt, overt racism. It wasn't. It wasn't like we were having moments like in an American movie where it's you know where the, the white guys like what you doing over here, boy. You know, there's none of that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. This isn't but the it's... opening. This isn't one of the opening scenes of Virtuosity, babe. Oh wow, that was a deep pull. Carl Reiner's favorite movie. What? <laughs> I think that was the one. Oh, no, sorry, it was the net. Never mind. The net was Carl a, Reiner's favorite movie. Is this, a, is this a bit? No, no. He it was the net specifically. Like for some reason, he kept he for over the years, and I don't know if he was doing a bit or if it was legit. But he would oh every now and then just tweet about how great a movie the net with Sandra Bullock was. <laughs> I feel like he probably saw it as a comedy because there's a lot of very Maybe. hilarious unintentional <laughs> moments in that movie. That's just really. If, if it was a bit, that's hilarious. If it wasn't, I still love him. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite film is Pootie Tang. <laughs> <sighs> Pootie Tang. Pootie Tang, also about World War Two. Uh, so I've heard. Mm. If you really like look into it, it's really about World War Two. Here's something, Brendan. I have to ask you real quick, and I don't know oh, if this. Please was a choice or if it was trying to cover something up but or i don't remember but um saeed has his right hand in his pocket most of the movie Hmm. i don't know i i I didn't notice if the actor perhaps had an issue with his hand that he wanted to hide or if there was a because i don't remember him like like losing a hand or anything at one point like even even when we finally see him fighting he's got a pistol that he's using in his left hand A, a p38 by the way that he clearly stole from a german are you saying that they shouldn't steal from Germans in the forties? Yeah, you saying, saying that the, they you saying were, that 
the Ger- the Germans were an honorable folk, and no, uh, but Brendan, you know my p- policy on the law. <laughs> you love it, all love of it. them. Love it, all I laws. Believe I- Yes, no, Jason. I I remember reading something about it, and you're right. So uh, Jamel Debuz's right arm was actually has actually been paralyzed since he was young. Oh, okay. Um, so he actually in that arm, you see him sometimes. He does have a gun, yeah. but he never actually fires it because he couldn't. Lit- literally couldn't do that with his right arm. So yeah, okay. you're right. Yeah, that's the actor. So interesting. Yeah, no, because it just I noticed it, and I just was wondering what was going on. Just fascinating. Yeah. They decided not to work it work it into the script apparently, but it was a it was a thing. I wish there'd have been a scene where he maybe I maybe there was maybe I missed it where he pulled a pistol off a off a German. <laughs> I mean, it might have happened. I, I gotta ask you too. Okay, so there's obviously you know a lot of like hyster- um, prejudice in this movie uh, between you know the colonial troops and the white troops. But my question is, I think there's a little bit within the colonial troops too because if you remember the scene the two brothers you mentioned Yasser yeah. and uh Labry there's a scene where they are going to brutally uh yeah. beat someone's head in and the other troops have to step in and be like whoa well i, I think it's a- a- abdul Qadar that stops in and he tells him he's like hey guys we're, we're soldiers not savages. we're not savages and yeah, they are so that- they are you know they're not as educated as abdul Qadar they're clearly you know more nomad tribesmen kind of guys and I mean, they're taking gold teeth out of a out of a German's head, and the Germans certainly took enough Jewish gold teeth during the Holocaust. Uh, so you know what? Maybe give it to them. But I understand Abdul Qadar's position. Yeah, um, it's just. It, I mean, yeah, I'm not saying the Germans were well behaved or anything, no. but it's just interesting that they show like that side of uh, of these troops that are like, don't make us look bad. Like don't don't give us the look that we're that don't I- enforce the stereotype that they're trying to perpetrate on us. Exactly, it's 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 the thing. It's the thing that every minority has had to deal with. Where it's like, no, we have yeah. to fucking stand up and be better than them because anything less than that is is they're just gonna use it against us. Well, I mean, I think in real life you see that with like people like Kanye West, right? Where the reaction from a lot of the a lot of the black community is fuck off, yeah, stop, stop this shit. You're making us look bad. <laughs> you're not a, a good representative right now at all. <laughs> you're you're making you're making some white people think that there are black people who like Nazis. That's not a good thing. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. I hate you, but I love you. What? <laughs> That's a, this is not brother love here, folks. Interestingly, I noticed what my moment that was interesting was they dropped uh, uh, propaganda leaflets over the forest, and it was clear the Germans knew that the colonial troops were there because they dropped leaflets in Arabic, telling people like, "Hey, it's it's good over here. We got food and warmth, and we'll take you and accept you." It sounds like you're doing uh, Seinfeld bed. It's like, "Hey, I'm going to accept you. I we'll mean, come you. on." Come on over here. We're Nazis. My- we got the, we got one thing in common. We hate Jews. <laughs> yeah, Jerry Jerry Seinfeld saying in his voice saying, "Yeah, we don't like Jewish people." Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to talk about the because uh, we got to talk about our, our core four, of course. But I want to mm-hmm. talk about uh, Masoud. Yeah, we haven't really he mentioned has him. A, yeah, well, he is he is the most interesting story, I think, because he yeah. actually, uh, you know, they're they're going through Marseille and he finds a nice lady and they go to town on each other, mm-hmm. um, and they they fall in love. I mean, that's what happens. He loves her, she loves him, and then like um, it's it's really it's really sad. Like even before the later stuff happens, but when they're in the room together and somebody accidentally opens the door real quick, and he reacts as if he's going to get killed. Yeah. And, of course, when you hear his explanation, yeah, of course, he's used to that because where he's from, if he was to go, you know, make it with a, a white French lady, he would probably be killed. It's, it's I don't possible. even think it was legal, right? Well, I mean, certainly the Pied Noir existed, so it must not have been illegal, but it may I have don't been know. Okay, looked I should, down I, upon. I should say legal, but I mean, I feel like if he did that and someone caught it, there's yeah. a very good chance he could be beaten or killed. It may be like that's fine in Algeria, but you're in the motherland now, so you got to behave yourself, bud. Yeah, well, and and then of course it's just like a like a maid or something, so he's fine. But the rest of the movie is just incredibly um, tragic because neither of them can find out what's going on with the other one because every letter he sends gets sent gets censored. Huh. Yeah. 
in, in that not, not just censored, but full on not delivered. Like it's not like yeah. they went through and blacked out stuff. They just didn't straight up deliver. Him. And and through a good chunk of the movie, he's like, I keep sending her letters and she never sends them back. Do you think she's abandoned me? Like, do you think she's not getting my letters? Like he's just going through this stuff. And of course, there's a part of me that's just like, guy, you got to move on. There's no, she just she's moved on but then we have that brief scene where we cut to Marseille and we see her in the office asking about him by name wanting to know because she and, and we learned that she has actually been writing him but her letters are not getting to him either and you could tell there's a moment too where they ask the name and she mm-hmm. says the name and there's some something in her voice that that she that I think she's realizing like mm, as soon yeah. as they hear the name they're not gonna be any not gonna they're not gonna shit. be helpful at all he just yeah. writes he's like okay he writes the name down and we'll let you know if we hear anything Mm-hmm. Yeah. <sighs> this movie's a real, a real upper. But then we've also got uh, Masoud uh, and a lot of the other guys too, who have been uh, ragging on on Saeed for being a steward, and they've been giving—I don't remember what they call him—but it's a name that's not nice and is clearly implying that he's like a a gay girly boy or something. Because yeah, he gets they really, call him a fairy or something. Basically, yeah, the equivalent of that because he's because he's you know ironing this guy's shirts. And Saeed finally snaps, <laughs> has to make a move, and he pulls out a fucking knife and puts it against. Uh, 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 Masood's uh, Masood's mouth. No, not mouth. Sorry, his throat. He puts his yeah. He puts it against his fucking throat, and he's jamming it. In. Like I'm surprised he didn't have like a, a half centimeter deep cut in his neck because Saeed was jamming it into his neck. Like, mm-hmm. and he's like, "You don't fucking call me that. You never do that again. You do that, I'll cut your goddamn throat." Which you could argue, like, okay, that's the that's kind of, uh, pretty pretty homophobic part to have a character get so mad about being called gay well, that he threatens to kill him. But I mean, these are all, st- but but I mean, also not with, also within the bounds of realism. These are soldiers; they would probably yeah. act that way. Well, and and he's it's it's he has to like make the move. He has to like step up and prove to them that he's not to be fucked with. And by putting that knife to uh, Mesamud's uh, uh, throat. I think that sent the message that, you know, he may be small and he may look young despite his mighty five o'clock shadow, but uh, you can't fuck with Saeed. I like that in the in their quest to get equal treatment, they finally give them like uh, some time for r and I guess some time to relax with the other <sighs> troops. And they have to go to this fucking the whitest fucking dance dance ballet. like ballet. Yeah, like a ballet ever. And clearly these I mean. I'm not. I'm not even saying it. At that point, I don't think it's a race thing. I think it's a class thing. Oh, because, absolutely. Because this is something you know for the upper class to enjoy, and clearly they're sitting there and they're very happy. But like everyone else is like, what the fuck is this shit? Well, and they're all kind of annoyed because they were told that they were going to go home. Because you know everybody, all all the white French troops are getting leave, so mm. they can go home and visit their families. But the and they just get to go watch be- dancing. Yeah, they send them. They send them to like a camp for some R and R, and they get to watch this fucking ballet. And that's supposed to be their their you know break from combat. And listen, this isn't a, this isn't a, an attack on ballet. I know there's people that love ballet genuinely, and that's great. But it's just it's just not reading the room. These guys don't want to see ballet. Yeah, the 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 girls' titties were not out, so they didn't want to wow. see nothing. Well, I mean, they're soldiers, Brendan. They're soldiers. I mean, you've been I combat mean, for a long time. You haven't seen many ladies. You can't tell that uh, two men host this podcast sometimes. <laughs> no, when Jason certainly says not. things. I'm just coming at it from the male perspective, and if I was in that situation, I'd be like, "Well, the ballet, I I appreciate the the thought, but um, get them titties out." Th- that's what you would say. I know. I said that's what I would think. Oh, you wouldn't say it out loud though, because you're a gentleman. Uh, it depends, I guess, on how much I had to drink. But I I I mean, I hope no amount to have you yell at the <laughs> dancer to get them titties out. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> What are you, a frat boy? Yeah, no, that's my... uh, You know what? I'm 40. I think it's time I start living like a frat boy. Yeah, I think it's time you start... uh, From from this point on, every every year, you just start acting like a person half that age. That's right. (laughs) You guys want to drink some cold shots? (laughs) Hey, I still do buy cold shots on occasion. It's it's the best value for beer at the store. There's no value. Shut up. (laughs) Um... Yeah, so, and and then that leads to that big uh, that big moment outside where they're they're protesting and we we talk the colonial troops are protesting and we talked about that because that's where Martinez 
uses that slur and says nobody like you will ever be a leader, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. And they end up in prison at one point. Like that whole storyline we talked about where uh, Masoud can't get to Irene. He gets desperate. And he's like, I'm going to Marseille. Fuck this. Yeah. And when he goes there, they think he's deserting and yeah. they throw him in prison. The only reason he gets out is because Abdel Kader is like, well, he's he's our best marksman. We need him. And they're like, yeah, I guess you're right. Well, and I remember Abdel Kader was in prison, too, because he had been stirring up shit after the ballet show, complaining about their treatment uh, yeah. and causing, you know, causing a, a little bit of a stir. And of course, you know, the, the authorities don't like that. So they huck him in the brig. Uh, I guess it's not a ship, so it's probably just prison. But uh mm -hmm. Yeah, so the two of them are in there, and they get Abdul Kadar gets pulled out for this special mission. Uh, they need them to go uh, uh, resupply ammunition to uh, to American troops in the Alsace region, as well as be the first uh, people in to reoccupy part of Alsace. Sorry, Jason, I don't know Al, but I wish you would stop talking about his body like that. Uh, ha, ha. So, uh, Brendan, I don't know if you know the, the geography there, but Alsace-Lorraine is a region of France. Uh, that um, has been very disputed over the long relationship with Germany uh, between who's who owns it. Uh, I think it is currently part of France as a result of the Second World War, but it had been part of Germany at various points. Uh, so that's that's a, a you know, taking Alsace is a big pop, big thing because it means you're pushing the Germans back to the fucking border. So what you're saying is rematch? Rematch, that's right. So... Yeah, so Abdul Qadar is down for this mission, but he's talking to the colonel and he's like, are we going to get recognized? I feel like we as colonial troops, we get nothing. We All the French troops get all the glory and not even glory, but like the recognition. And I want my men to be recognized and to have those rewards. And the colonel looks at him and says, you'll have your recognition. You'll have your rewards. I and promise. Their recognition is everyone except for Abdul getting killed. Yeah, but we're not quite there yet. I'm just saying that's what their recognition is. We don't yeah. have to go in order, Jason. Well, Calm I mean, down. so so they so they they go out on this mission, right? And then they have a they have a white captain with them. They've got Martinez, and then they've got a bunch of troops. And they're walking through the forest, and the white captain trips on a trip mine, which then, of course, causes panic and chaos. And the horses start running off, and there's fucking trip mines going off all over the place. Horses are exploding. It's a it's a real mess. Yeah, and it by really the time, took me back to the Saw video game. Yes, absolutely. And by the time the smoke clears and everybody, you know, that's still alive kind of realizes what happens, they're down. They're down a lot of people and the captain's dead and Martinez is injured. So they they so they kind of scout ahead and get to the nearest village, which is in Alsace, and they kind of check it out and it's abandoned at this point. There are a lot of dead German corpses around. I don't know why I need to say dead, dead German corpses. corpses. Dead German corpses, not the living not corpses. Not living corpses. No, they haven't been reanimated yet. Uh, oh, this, man, that's the sequel. It's where it, Days of Glory 2, Shockwaves. <laughs> <laughs> why Shockwaves? Because that's a movie about uh, zombie Nazis. Oh, okay, sure. <laughs> With Peter Cushing, come on. It's why like Gilligan's our... Island meets zombie Nazis. Why is that not on our list, Jason? Uh, it's not technically a war movie. It's more of a Nazi zombie movie. Uh, you said it's also Nazi. terrible. So, Jason, I ask again, why are we not talking about it? We can talk about that on your other show. Mm. For Screen and Bunt Tree. Yeah. So they get to the village. They they get Martinez there. They put him in a bed. You know, the, the locals kind of clean him up and keep him alive. And there's not a lot. There's still some people left in this village. And they seem, you know, at least cautiously happy to see our, our heroes. And so they are in that village for a bit, and they're kind of like, because they're that's their job is they're supposed to take that village and hold it. And mm -hmm. at that point, there there literally is at what the the four of them is it or five of them? No, it's just four of them, and and then Martinez is laid up. Yeah, it's yeah, very very few of them. And then once the Germans start piling in, it's like, what are we gonna yeah. do? Yeah, a, a, a unit of about what seems like about twenty German guys shows up, and they got an MG with them and everything. And then again, and then, the tragedy, going back to the tragedy, is that Masoud is obviously one of the ones that get killed. And now we know for sure Irene will never know what mm -hmm. happened. They'll never tell her. Yeah, it was it was messed up. So so when Masoud dies, it's after he there was an explosion. There was a Panzer Shrek fire near him, I think, that blew up a building. And he got like jostled by it. And he stood up stunned and then basically turned around. And there was a young German soldier who then just put a couple bullets in him. Yeah, so sudden... Then, 
and then Saeed and Martinez, Saeed goes into the house to try to like, you know, help Martinez and get him out. And a fucking German who must be deaf, uh, uh, fired off his Panzer Shrek, which folks is a rocket launcher, fires off his Panzer Shrek into a room in the house with Saeed and Martinez and manages to kill Saeed, still doesn't manage to kill Martinez. Martinez is still fucking alive after this. And then the German saw, then the, I guess the Panzer Shrek guy must pull out his pistol or something and put a couple rounds in him, but. He does, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I love the use of a Panzer Shrek. I don't know if they just happen to have access to a Panzer Shrek model and they really wanted to use it because they really focused on this guy running around with this rocket launcher in the house, being in the building, blowing out walls and stuff with it. Like, <laughs> Yeah, this, this final um, street battle i guess yeah. is really interesting to me in terms of a w war battle scene because i think it's one of the first that we've talked about where we actually get like it ends up being like one man taking on many you know yeah. like like there's a it's single-handedly for quite a bit quite a while and he's holding his own just up until the troops come in finally yeah. to meet him well because they like because so they they ambush the the first germans that come into the town right like i said there's maybe 15 20 of them and they ambushed them and they killed them all. And they're triumphant for a sec, but then a whole bunch, bunch of more Germans come in. And so that's when they kind of start their fighting. And you got yeah, Seer up in the building firing his Tommy gun. He's having like a duel with a guy with an MG42 down on the ground, just slung across the back of a dead body. Uh, and finally manages, I, actually, I don't think it's him. I think it's uh, Abdul Qadar that shoots the, the MG42 gunner. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, and then and then Yasir yeah, gets shot in the back while they're while he's running away with Abdul Qadar. And it basically boils down to Abdul Qadar being by himself and about to be killed. And then the cavalry shows up. A whole bunch of more colonial troops come in and just fucking flood into the village and, and take out the Germans. Yeah. And he survives. Everybody else is fucking dead. He, he survives. Get, and he gets, and he gets a, some applause, too. But it's kind of hollow at this point. It's like, look at well, all the stuff he's lost. Look at all the so, stuff, all the shit he's gone through. Brendan, the end of this movie is one of the most heartbreaking things I've ever seen. Yes, he's, and he's, can I can I just say one quick thing though before please, you describe please. it? The thing that gets me the most is that you think the first thing is the tragedy. The first thing that they, pre they present to you, you think that is the tragic end because we've seen it a million times. Somebody going to a cemetery years later and visiting the graves of their loved ones who died in battle. But then the movie does a 180 and that's not the real tragedy. But please go on. Well, I hadn't even got there yet. I'm gonna say that that is that's that as well. But we're gonna get there. So, okay. so Abu Ghadar is in the street. The troops are walking down. A jeep rolls by. It's the colonel that he talked to before. He walks yeah. up trying to get to talk to the colonel, and they won't let him near him. He's like, I just need a moment with the colonel, please. And they're like, No, 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 no. And finally, the guy's like, Well, who are you? He goes, I'm I'm Corporal Abu Ghadar. He goes, uh, uh, What unit are you with? He goes, I don't have a unit. He goes, What do you mean? I go, he goes, they're all dead. He's like, oh, looks over. He goes, hey, Sergeant, you need someone? Here's a guy. You're with him now. And just coldly sends him off. Yeah. And it's just, and he's just walking through the village. And that's when we get that little, like, kind of applause. Mm -hmm. And it's just, he's just like, yeah, they just, they lied to me. The guy told him to his face, you will be recognized. We will talk. No. You ignores know. him completely and and the thing that really fucking drives at home is when he's walking down that street he turns his head and he sees all the french people posing with white soldiers mm -hmm. all the white soldiers are the ones that liberated the village on film not him That's right not despite him. the fact that he and his friends gave their lives despite the fact that it was colonial troops that then came in and flushed out the village no it's the white troops that are in the film and then, Jason, just to hammer it home yeah. even more. Just, is... to say, just to make sure you don't go home with any semblance of happiness in you. <laughs> well, I mean, I think it's important that this movie doesn't fabricate yes, any kind absolutely. of happy ending. But we get we, we get a title card that says 60 years later, to which I responded, what? <laughs> I was a little shocked at this. So, And then, of course, we had, see Abdul Qadir as an older man visiting the graves of all his, uh, you know, former comrades and people in the tr uh, in his troop and everything. And he's, of course, very sad and everything. You think, okay, this is, like I said, like I said earlier, this is the typical thing you see, you know, Saving Private Ryan yes. shit, right? Like, you see him, like, you know, uh, tell me I was a good man, that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. But um, not maybe not so much that part, but just the, the whole visiting the graves at the end of the movie and seeing the fallen soldiers that you served with. So, okay, great. End of movie? No. Then we get we see him getting on a bus 
going and and going to his not great little flat little place that he's living and we get the title card that tells us that once these uh colonized nations that france used to poach you know soldiers from once these nations became independent yeah they stopped increasing their pensions yeah. um for, i think they said from like 1959 or something, something like, like that. that yeah yeah and on and they yeah they stopped because they weren't a part of france quote unquote yeah. anymore these people that fought for france yeah almost gave their lives you know the ones that didn't actually give their the ones that didn't die that are still alive after this their pension increases are frozen because their country dared to be separate from france and then and then the french court said no this is bullshit you got to pay these people and then the governments just were like you know what We, we just won't do it oh no they i i believe what i read is they did unfreeze them but they owe them like forty years of retroactive pay, pension pay, and they and they're not going to give it to them. They haven't no. given anything to them yet. It's ridiculous. It's it's insane. They're just, hoping, they're just waiting them out at this point. Oh, I mean, it's probably already done at this point. Honestly, this movie this movie um did help apparently a little bit. Like when this movie mm-hmm. came out, and they kind of made the world more aware of that situation. It did it did help to the point of like they started doing it. But they certainly didn't go back and cover what they what they didn't give them mm. in the past. Forty years, Jason. Yeah. Can you imagine that getting that as a fucking stipend on your pay? <laughs> yeah, that'd be nice. Jesus to get that back. Christ. But Jason, maybe we should uh, take a breath. Sounds like a plan. Our thoughts. What What did you say? I said, "Sounds like a plan." Oh, okay. I thought you were making a, a, a jab or some kind of jibe. Um, but we're going to take a breath. We're going to collect our thoughts and we, we're going to listen to some ads with you. We're going to be on the other end listening and we will be right back. Hi, y'all. This is stock car driver Rusty Cole from the film Days of Thunder. You know, I've been in a lot of movies over the years that have been stock car related, but I got to say, Days of Glory might actually be the best Days of movie I ever done saw. You should come on down and check out Age of Radio. They don't talk about stock cars much, but they sure do like movies. Age of Radio and for screen and country. It's like two good tastes together. Days of glory, hallelujah. Days of glory, hallelujah. Time for Brendan and Jason to read their bits and bombs about days of glory, hallelujah. Bits and bombs. One of the things I like about this movie, I think, is its attention to detail. And one of the ways that it has attention to detail is that these, as we pointed out many times, are colonial troops. The main army doesn't really give a shit about them. So if you'll notice throughout the movie, they're mostly wearing, like, hand-me-down American uniforms. Mm-hmm. Uh, from the Probably from Lend-Lease, which was a thing that the Americans were doing. So they would have been... And also, a lot of the guys are wearing Doughboy helmets, even. So they were, like, getting uh, just... Whatever equipment was available, I noticed that they tended to be using American weapons. Not not all of them, but there I definitely saw M1 Garands and Tommy guns and things of that nature. Um, it was interesting too because then you would occasionally see the white guys and their helmets. They had the traditional like kind of fancy French uh, uh, helmet, where again all the colonial troops just got whatever shit was sent them. In this case, American cast off stuff. Yes. Um, we didn't really talk about a lot of the way this movie shot. I mean, it's pretty straightforward in parts, but I think uh, a lot of times it has a sort of a realism look, mm. like a kind of just someone's just there shooting it. Like it, it kind of there's some there's a lot of handheld at times. Um, yeah. I like that because it it, it kind of grounds the movie because m- much of the movie is very grounded. Like I don't find it's over the top at all. There's any yeah. moments of like you fall for my freedom, no. brother. Like nothing no. like that. Nothing like this that. movie is kind of fighting against that for the most part yeah. and just in in tune with how the movie is clearly on the side of these colonial soldiers the soundtrack is very in tune with that we mm-hmm. get a lot of like uh very i guess i would say culturally appropriate music mm-hmm. throughout this movie which it, it just gives it another flavor too you know you're watching so that, it and you're like that, that i don't you don't usually you, 
I'll tell you this: when I hear that music in an American film, usually it means the villains are coming. As sad yeah, as it is it's, to say, it's either the villains are coming or it's like it's like a a movie set in like 2005 in Iraq, like yeah, or you're watching yeah. like Black Hawk Down or something. Yeah, you know? yeah, oh yeah, great movie though. Uh, we'll I mean, talk like, about oh, sh- that. It's like oh shit, we're in Somalia. I assume that's on the list. It is, yeah. Okay, good, because I, I would have said we had to put it on if it wasn't. Um, yeah, no, that that music is really nice, and it, and it, it, it's interesting in a World War II movie because it's yeah, it's clashing with your kind of traditional uh, mm. thoughts of what a World War II movie is. Um, I really like the shots when they're when they're running up the mountain, the side of the mountain, and we get these nice wide shots of seeing all the guys going up the side and seeing the you can see the Germans firing down on them and everything and. Like it, there's some pretty impressive like scenery. There's a nice shot too where they're like walking along, and you have like a couple of squadrons of planes flying overhead, and that looked really nice. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, like they they I don't know what the budget on this was, Brendan. Fourteen point five. So clearly they did a lot with what they had. They they really yeah. made that fourteen point five million sing. Oh, sorry, no, fourteen point five dollars. Oh wow, they they really stretched it out. That's ooh, that doesn't bode well for what they paid the cast though. Mm, ham sandwiches that were left over uh, from the shooting of. That's um, a real shitty thing to do to a bunch of uh, uh, cast members that are quite reasonably probably Muslim. Listen, it was imitation ham. I don't know. Is imitation ham halal? I can't tell. Made out of bacon. Oh no. <laughs> I need to point out, too, that the the unit that they are part of, the 7th Algerian, I looked it up, uh, and they are one of the most decorated units in French Army history. Uh, they existed from, I think, World War I era until, like, the 60s or 70s, and they were merged with a different unit, but they are, the, the, the lineage is there. So uh, these guys, at some point, were recognized, at least as far as medals go, but... Um, yeah, it's clear that during during the time there wasn't much uh, much appreciation, unfortunately. Jason, I noted this movie um, not throughout the whole thing, but when it wants to be, this movie is pretty bloody. This movie gets gory at times. Mm-hmm. There's one shot where this guy is blown up, and we literally see just like the top half of his body. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he's like right there. He's like, hey, if if you stay here, you're going to die. And then a fucking shell hits him, and yeah, it's just his torso and not much else. Like it doesn't, it doesn't over. Like it's not Hacksaw no. Ridge for God's no. sakes, but there are a lot of moments where I was like, "Whoa!" Like I know the movie's rated R, but I still wasn't expecting some of those uh, moments. Why am well, I talking like Yogi Bear? I don't. Know. I know this movie's rated R. Rated R. I'm smarter than the average movie goer. Um, <laughs> yeah, and and that's the thing, and that that's that's almost more disturbing, I think, in a lot of ways, because like if you watch a movie and it's over the top of blood and gore. I just and I don't know maybe I'm the crazy one but I laugh at that. If I if I see like the kind of like just so violent over the top like it's just funny. But in comparison sake you see like that where it's like it's not like that. It's just kind of it's just a moment it happens and there it is. It's just like fuck that's probably what it's actually like in real life. It's just one moment there's a guy there and the next moment it's just a fucking hunk of meat on the ground. And and I would argue there's way there's ways that a movie can be very bloody and very gory and for it for it to strike hard oh, yes. and be impactful, Absolutely. but I th- I think it's all in the way you shoot it because I I oh, could see sure. something like I could see something like in um uh like I don't know like a big action movie like something stupid in like an expendable sequel and laugh but then I see something like you know uh like Schindler's List is an exceptionally yes. bloody and graphic movie and and mm-hmm. I would not no I would maybe not chuckle at that. I hope not. I hope not. I don't want to be the one guy in the theater suppressing a giggle. Oh, Jason, that reminds me of... Oh, my God. There was a movie... Uh, to, taking you back to the days of working at the movie theater. And I'm going to find out the name of the movie. Um, there was a movie with Matthew McConaughey that we had playing at our theater one time. Uh-huh. And it, it had a... Um, it had themes of slavery. And I'm trying to find what it was called. But... Oh, Free State of Jones. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Called. Yeah, it's based sort of based on a true story. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Matthew McConaughey plays a uh, a medic for the Confederate Army, um, who's opposed to slavery. Yeah. Uh, rather help the wounded than fight the Union. Now I'm just reading the description. But anyway, <laughs> this movie was playing, and there was a guy, and I don't know if he was drunk or if he was just a fucking piece of shit, but he got up 
and started laughing and cheering when people were being whipped. Oh, Jesus Christ. And and, and this was like not uh, a super big movie, but there was a crowd when this happened, a, a decent crowd. And that, Jason, I, I've never seen... I had a manager at the time. My manager, you know, he didn't move super fast. Okay, he's a big mm-hmm. guy. But he deliberate in his movements. Yeah. Never seen him run faster than I've seen <laughs> him run that night. Goes into the theater, grabs this guy, and is like, "Out!" Yeah, like fuck this so quick. So yeah, so that's just it. You know, we joke about like, "Oh, that would be awful." I've seen it happen. You've and seen it, it actually awful. happen. Yeah, it's it's one awful. of those things. It's 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 one of those real life things that if it were in a movie script, it would probably be really funny. But when it happens in real life, it's horrifying. <laughs> in a movie script, you'd probably be like, "Nah, that's pretty far." I don't think anyone would ever do that. Yeah, yeah. this is just in like, I mean, sh- certainly. Don't get me wrong. There's racism everywhere, but that's yeah. not something you expect to see in Fredericton, New Brunswick. <laughs> well, and especially so like out blatant, blatant. That's what I'm saying. So, so loud and blatant. Like, yeah, mm. you, I mean, there's, there's plenty of racists in Canada, Brendan. We, we both uh, no, know I, that. But listen, there's a, there's but a they, lady, there's a lady that thinks she's royalty that goes all over Canada. I'm aware of all the racism in Canada, yeah, but, but a lot I'm just of them saying. just mostly keep their mouths shut about it. Or, yeah. or they, they don't like, they're not out there shouting it from the street corners, but. So exactly. That's yeah. what I mean. Like you're, you're just not used to seeing stuff like that up close so much, like around here anyway. So it just, uh, really, uh, oof, oof, magoof. Yeah. Maybe I should watch this movie. <laughs> I guess so. Maybe that'd be, uh, maybe we should put that on our list somewhere if it's during the civil war. Ah, there we go. Uh yeah no here we go so when when um when uh uh Yasir and Labry are talking about like I think it's Yasir says what do they call it when they massacred our families oh yeah pacification because mm. that's what they would have done I mean again these guys are like tribesmen so these were definitely guys that probably got into it with French forces and suffered for it yeah. <sighs> Yeah, they really the the movie does a good jo- does a good job at making you be like, yeah, these people are are like these particular members of the colonial forces are acting much more aggressively than some of the other ones, but you know, it's not like they're doing it for no reason. Yeah, exactly. So he got a little kiss near the end of the movie, so I'm happy that he died getting a nice little kiss because I doubt he got many kisses being a goat herder back in fucking Algeria. The I, I mean I'll watch people get blown up all day, but I obviously don't like it much when animals get blown up, and uh, no. that mule getting blown up was not not nice. There no, was also no, a dead okay. dog, I believe, in this movie that was not nice either. I'm glad <sighs> I missed most of this. <laughs> <laughs> it was just a corpse on the ground. I'm sure it was fake, uh, mm. but it looked real. I wish more movies would use that old Panzer Shrek. It's just such a cool cool fucking rocket launcher. Give the Germans the rocket launchers and movies, and then it's better when we defeat them because then they seem stronger. Yeah, it's wrestling rocket, logic, Brendan. Make rocket launchers German again is what I got that's, from that. That's right. Make rocket launchers German again. I got to get that on a hat. Um, make don't make it red, please. For the love of Christ, don't make it red. I think the last thing I have to mention here is, and we haven't talked about this moment yet, but there's that moment when after everything is said and done. After the combat, like after the colonial troops come through and there's a moment, Abdul Qadar walks into the room where Martinez and Saeed's bodies are. Mm-hmm. He takes off his helmet and he starts to cry briefly and intensely. He has a little moment. He pulls himself together, he puts his helmet back on and he walks back out the door. Just a moment of a man, or a man having a moment to himself of being able to, to even for a second, process those emotions, but then having to pull it all back together and just get back to it. Yeah. I mean, that's what full war is, unfortunately. Just people going through those traumas every day and being like, well, I got to keep going. Just short, intense burst of emotion, which yeah. is probably something that happened all the time. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So yeah, not a not a great ending to a movie. I mean, it's real. It happened. I mean, a, gr- a great and, ending, but not a happy. Oh, ending, fantastic, sure. fantastic, con- fantastically constructed ending to leave you uh, in a mess when you walk into the theater. Yeah. Well, Jason, do you want to know a little bit more about this movie? Please. Okay. 
Well, I, I first I want to talk about how uh, sort of tangentially related to this movie. But in 2009, the BBC published documentary evidence that showed black colonial soldiers who, together with North African troops, made up around two thirds of free French forces and how they were deliberately removed from the units that led the Allied advance to liberate Paris in 1944. Uh, Charles de Gaulle made it clear that he wanted free French troops to enter the French capital first, and in response, Allied command therefore insisted that all black soldiers should be replaced by European and North African ones from other French units. Um, historian uh, Julian Jackson talked about this. He said, once Algeria had been conquered by the Allies, de Gaulle was finally allowed to go there in May 1943. Now Algiers replaced London and Brazzaville as the capital of the Free French. Even more important was the fact that Algeria contained an important reservoir of North African troops. At the end of 1942, de Gaulle's total forces never numbered more than 50,000. But now in 1943, thanks to Algeria, he had an army of about half a million men. This multiracial army was first thrown to battle in Italy in 1943, mm -hmm. landed with Americans in southern France in August 1944. In the words of uh, one senior American general, it was, quote, the only French division which could be made 100% white, even if, it was not a, even if it was not at de Gaulle's instigation, this whole thing where he made people, you know, he took people out to make it look like it was all whiteies. Um, it doesn't seem he particularly objected to this whitewashing mm -hmm. of the last stages of the Free French epic. The French were quick to forget that it was thanks to their colonial soldiers that they had any claim to have re-entered the war in 1944 as a great power. So 50,000 to half a million. Yeah. That's, well, that's the it. It impact was, that they had. Well, that's it, because they were able to unite the free French forces with the with the French colonial forces that were, you know, the forces of the Fourth Republic that were still there. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, just to compare, like when we talked about glory, like how, how much as a percentage, like uh, the movie Glory represented a, a smaller percentage of the overall troops, right? The uh, percentage of troops as far as what? The troops that, you know, included like Denzel Washington and Morgan Freeman's character. Like they were overall a small percent. Like it was mostly white people on either side, right? Uh, yes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Although so, they're, uh, yeah, the USCT was, I, I don't know how big it was. I'd actually have to look that up, I suppose. But I don't think it was, yeah, I don't think it was huge, but. And and we already talked about their amazing contributions to the to the Union for the Civil War. So just to just to put that in perspective, this four hundred and fifty thousand of nearly half a million of these troops were not even were colonial troops. Colonial troops, and, yeah. And they treated them like absolute dog shit. And it's another one of those situations. It's like I I I think the number is the four hundred and forty second. But during World War Two, there was also there was a Japanese American division. Uh, yeah. or battalion or something that was made up of Japanese American troops and they took some of the heaviest casualties in the war and they were one of the most decorated divisions of the war because again they had to prove themselves they had to be more aggressive and better fighters than the white guys to get any respect they couldn't just equal them they had to be better than them it's the same with these guys the Algerians one of the most decorated units in the war because they had to do that to get any sort of respect and well and Jason that's why I'm glad we've ended racism and it's over yeah, oh, I know. It's been great, hasn't it? You know, remember the 90s? That was when racism ended. It was awesome. 1997, September 4th. I remember it well. That's right. When when Ellen came out, racism was over. Uh, yeah, weirdly. And they <laughs> they said, did it as a two for one. Yeah, she said, I'm gay. And people were like, you know what? No more homophobia. No more racism. Right. The end. That's right. So just one bit of trivia I wanted to mention, because we already mentioned uh, that uh, fella's uh, arm that wasn't that was paralyzed. But mm -hmm. the main actors who are all of North African descent did not know of France's discrimination towards foreign soldiers serving in the French army huh. during World War Two until filming began. God damn it. So that's how little it was discussed. That's um, the French education this, system for you. This and this movie came out in 2006. Yeah, it's that's not crazy. like this is in the in the fifth, like the 60s. This is like. You know, uh, oh. 18 years ago. It makes me wonder what horrific things our country has done that I don't know about. I mean, I know that's we've done a lot of horrific things, but like, what don't I know about? Exactly. Well, that's what's why. That's why we're always changing the educational system, Jason. Look what's going on. <laughs> look, look what's already happened in Florida. Yeah. Well, they yeah, they just they don't want to acknowledge it. Christ. Yeah. They got to be like Roman Reigns. They got to acknowledge it. Right. Acknowledge me. That's what the exactly. whole state says. And then, so, and, then, and then you'll hear, acknowledge me, and that's Ron DeSantis. Ugh. 
<laughs> I'm going to end Disney. Shut up. Meatball Ron. We love him, folks, don't we? Meatball Ron. He's, as a, great, I've said, he's a great fella. As I've said to others, um, just let me just let me be mad at Disney for real reasons. Other, I I don't want to get mad at them. I'm not mad at them for wokeness. Let me get mad yeah. at them for an actual there, reason to get mad. There's at lots them. of there's lots of pragmatic real reasons to be mad at Disney. If anything, the wokeness is one of their strong suits. That's yeah. It's the one one thing they're doing right. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so the reaction to this movie, uh, Days of Glory has an approval rating of 83% on Rotten Tomatoes, average rating of 7.23 out of 10. Uh, the overall consensus says, Days of Glory is a powerful historical epic that pays homage to a valiant group of soldiers whose sacrifices have largely been forgotten. Um, just a couple of critics here. Uh, Jonathan Richards of Film.com said, Instead of guys named Danny and Polak and Saul and Brooklyn, you got guys named Saeed and Yasser and Masoud and Abdul Kader. But it's not the same deal. Prick them, do they not bleed? Blow them up, do their limbs not scatter and their guts not spill? Uh, Jonathan Trout of BBC said, Its message is dimmed by a procession of war and race movie cliches that even this cast and epic cinematography cannot revive. So that's a that's a downer of a review. Hmm. And then the last one I want to mention is Michael Wilmington of the Chicago Tribune who said, Few war movies are as moving as days, but even so, this film doesn't romanticize. It's hard, clear, full of empathy for its characters, and lucid in its insight into their plight. I would yeah. I would agree with that. I, I never felt it was overwhelmingly, like, uh, saccharine or anything like that. No, and, and I don't, like, the... the, the the if if the if the racist stuff was tropey, it didn't feel tropey to me. Like it felt didn't f- real. It felt legit. Yeah. It felt like it was highlighting this as opposed to just diving into some sort of trope. Like it, it's not. It it didn't feel like fucking Green Book. No, I mean, <laughs> I haven't seen Green Book, but you you know. But but I I think if I say it didn't feel like Green Book, you know exactly what I'm talking. I know. About. Yes, I know exactly what you mean. Yeah, it didn't <laughs> didn't feel like a weird forced uh, uh, maybe. Not necessarily dishonest, but uh, maybe misguided. Take. Yeah, hey, I'm just, I'm just dumb Vigo Mortensen. I just, I think I gotta be racist. Maybe just show me how I can't, I shouldn't be racist. Put the onus on you, Mahershala Ali. Okay. Kind of so, uh, what what foods would it be right to suggest that uh, aren't racist for you? <laughs> okay, and with that, um, <laughs> we move on to see. <laughs> Jason, this movie does go to the Oscars. It's nominated for one Oscar that it does not win. What do you think? I assume it's best foreign language picture. You are correct. The winner that year is The Lives of Others, which is a movie I've heard about but not seen. <laughs> uh, no BAFTAs. Uh, like I said, $14.5 million budget, and it makes around $22.5 million. So it does okay for itself. Um, <laughs> I'll give you a pass. But <laughs> the most important thing, of course, and, oh, and just, to, just as a quick aside, um, I don't think this movie is like super well known because I did put it out no. there. I got one person, Adam Pellman. Hey, old Adam, uh, old reliable Adam Pellman. Yes, Adam Pellman said uh, he thinks it was excellent. He said the ending scene set in modern France hit really hard, and I remember thinking at the time that this film tackles injustice in a way that many American World War II films don't, despite everything yeah. we know about the racism faced by black American GIs and mm-hmm. other uh, minoritized groups at the time. That's true. How many movies do you see about that? Not too many. No, and, and not in this way. And also, this I mean, this is a, a little bit unique because America's dabbles in colonialism were rather brief mm-hmm. um whereas france it, it, like britain it was a long tradition <laughs> and yeah. there was a lot of harm caused over a long time and that's you know that it, obviously everybody's horrible and i'm not going to compare how horrible is everybody to to everybody but it's like colonialism is a slightly different thing than slavery uh but mm-hmm. one one certainly can involve the other i'll tell you that <laughs> Well, on that happy note, Jason, uh, why don't you tell us, why don't you tell us, why don't you tell us, why don't, why don't you tell us, why don't you tell us what you thought of this movie? Give us, of course, your very official rating and uh, yeah, let us know. Hit us up. Tell us. The movies that we've watched so far that have uh, like affected me the most are so often movies that are coming from perspectives that I wasn't really familiar with or maybe that I hadn't considered as deeply. And... This movie is one of those. I, I, I put this up there with something like City of Life and Death. Like, this is a fantastic movie. This is a story that needs to be told. 
Um, the actors in it are wonderful. The the the, the cinematography is great. The sound like like this this is a wonderful piece of art. This is a great war movie. It's it's saying something beyond just having a war movie for war movie's sake. It's trying to highlight the plight of colonial troops. Um, and let that be known because, again, it's something that we don't think about. We as white people, for sure, don't necessarily think about colonial troops in World War II, if we do at all. Maybe we're too busy thinking about the fucking Roman Empire. But, no, Brendan, this movie is fantastic and I think stands among the great war movies of all time. Uh, really. I mean, I liked it that much. Uh, uh, and all the respect in the world for making it, all respect to everybody involved. This is fucking fantastic. And I would happily, uh, uh, if I was going to give somebody a, 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 like a handful of DVDs, I would definitely include this alongside uh, City of Life and Death and um, Airplane. I thought for some reason you were going to say Airport. <laughs> airport 76 motherfucker yeah so what, what and your very official rating jason uh my very official rating is uh uh nine uh inshallahs out of ten okay you know what you know what i'm gonna bump it up 10 inshallahs out of 10 this is a fucking this is a 10 out of 10 wow there you have it um I'm going to go with three inches out of 20. It's okay, but <laughs> <laughs> no, um, this is, uh, this is, yeah, this was terrific. This was really, I mean, uh, on, on, in the first place, it's refreshing to see because we don't get things like this very often. We don't get to see this perspective. We don't, it's not the raw, raw, raw war movies that we no. get. Um, it's very much from like I said, from a perspective that we don't get often because it's a difficult perspective because it forces yeah. us to look at ourselves and be like, hey, you know what? Fuck the Nazis. But let's not forget what was going on on our side. It's like the Nazis were super racist, but we were and also awful. still pretty racist. <laughs> Maybe we didn't have death camps. Yeah. But, but I mean. But not, not for necessarily not wanting them. I'm sure there was a few people you would have asked. They would have been down. But let's not pretend. Let's not wash the story in. Uh, every every single Allied troop was a uh, a beautiful, embracing uh, human being of every race, creed, and color. Because that's clearly not what that situation was. No, no. And obviously, I joked about this earlier, but clearly, it, unfortunately, there's relevancy in it to this day. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I mean, and if you want a movie with. Uh, it's it's kind of for everybody because there's 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 great like you know there's great um, character moments there's great acting there's great story weaving through if you want um, if you want great battle scenes it's got that too like it's also it's also it just works as a war movie as well so you know what Jason you convinced me I was gonna go a half step lower but I am also gonna I'm gonna be right there with you and I'm gonna say that this movie I'm gonna give it uh, five baguettes. Out of five croissants. Oh, oui, oui, monsieur. Et merci de le tout le monde, de les personnes qui euh, euh, écoutaient euh, notre podcast. Euh, euh, je m'appelle Jason et mon ami Brandon. Euh, euh, dis merci à toi pour euh, euh, juste euh, euh, télécharger l'épisode, hein? You know, I'm from Quebec and I still only understood about half of that. <laughs> I thank the people for listening to the podcast and for downloading it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think most of that was because I was too focused on your ridiculous accent that you were doing. <laughs> oh, mon ami. And, 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 and folks... 100% he was doing Quebec French, not France French. No, 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 mon ami. Je parle comme uh, Pepe Le Pew. No, not anymore. Can't do that. Oh, he's no. over. Je, Pepe je excuse, mon ami. <laughs> he, got, he got run over. He's done. Um, oh, oui. <laughs> well, there you go. So that's that's it. We talked about this, this, uh, this movie, Days of Glory. But, Jason, we are going to stay... We're going to stay the course with this, though. We are going to stay with this. We're going to stay on this list for at least a month or so. Right, and we are back into it. We are, we are done fucking around with all that bullshit we just did. We are back to the real business of movie. 
That's true. That's that's correct. That's correct. And you know what, Jason? Mm-hmm. To hell, we're gonna stick with it. We're gonna stick with World War Two next mo- next week. Almost said next why, month. Why Can not? you imagine if this was a monthly podcast? We would oh, do wow. this oh. until we were ghosts. <laughs> Well, I mean, if we if, if we wanted to keep the same amount of content, we'd have to do one monthly, like, eight-hour podcast. Do you think we could do that? I mean, if we recorded it throughout the month and then accumulated <laughs> it at the end, maybe. <laughs> Uh, man, they talked about uh, they talked about ice cold and Alex for a long time. <laughs> I didn't know they could get so detailed. Um, next week, Jason, we are going to go back. Um, we are we course to the, the future. Uh, no, I'm sorry, not at all. Actually, um, we talked about a movie that was released in 2006. We're going to go backwards quite a bit. We're going to go back to 1953. And we're going to talk about a movie directed by who I think is one of the maybe the best directors of all time, uh, Billy Wilder. Um, okay. We're going to talk about the uh, prison uh, pr- prisoner of war film Stalag Seventeen. Ooh, I've never seen. It's a a famous film. Yes, it is. It's a it's a dreary Christmas, nineteen forty four, for the American POWs in Stalag Seventeen, and the men in Barracks Four. All sergeants have to deal with a grave problem. There seems to be a security leak. That's right, Ta-da. folks. Starring Robert Strauss, William Holden, Don Taylor, and Otto Preminger, Peter Graves, uh, Michael Moore, who I can only assume is the filmmaker who made Bowling sure. for Columbine. Certainly, why not? <laughs> P- uh, Peter Graves he was on A&E he used to narrate biographies and shit yeah Peter Graves he was on Mission Impossible Peter Graves Phil Hartman played him a f- few times yes he did <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> and of course our old pal William Holden from uh, uh, a very old episode where we watched Bridge on the River Kwai yeah that was a couple weeks ago well, wasn't it mm, if you mean like five years ago then yes five years wow so that's what we'll talk about next week. Stalag 17. Uh, so check it out. It is available in Canada. It is available on Tubi. Um, oh. Assuming the same for the States. And if I am wrong, well, you can kiss my ass because you are not uh, North Americans to me. And folks, I'm if just... you want. I, folks, by the way, if you were going to watch Stalag 17, if you want, I would also suggest you watch the entire run of Hogan's Heroes in the lead up to it. So, And, and, and I'm glad you interrupted my, uh, my apology. <laughs> um i obviously don't think that uh americans you guys are cool some of you uh you know Mm. who you are you know who you are is what i'm saying if you listen to this podcast and you're like and you're like based on what brendan and jason like i'm probably not cool then you're probably not cool r.i.p joe flaherty one of my favorite americans that's good few yeah there you go (laughs) you caught me off guard with that jason um (laughs) Okay, so there you go. That's that's all. That's that's it. That's all. Um, you can find our uh, our home base, our podcast home base is at Age of Radio. You can go to ageofradio.org slash for screen. And country. You can find us on social media. We're on Facebook. We're on uh, X. And we're on Blue Sky at FSAC pod as in for screen. And country. Uh, <laughs> Is your whole goal to throw me off this episode? Uh, podcast, <laughs> Jason. Uh, what, what are you? Are you are you still on Truth Social these days? Heating up your phone? I think you need like an ID to sign up for Truth Social or something. And I'm not giving them my ID. You'd Fuck think that. you'd think that Republicans of all people would be the ones yeah. that would be like, I'm not. I'm certainly not giving you my ID. Yeah, Actually, that's think. probably that's. Go. That's probably why the app is bombing so hard, actually. <laughs> yeah, probably, probably. Uh, at Jason D. McLeod on the ats, that is M-A-C-L-E-O-D, Blue Sky Twitter, come on by, set a spell. Nobody ever does, but please, if you're there, hit me an at. Hit me an at. I still hear from Color Horizon once in a while. We were talking wrestling recently. Oh, oh, Jason, I'm so sorry. You should not have said that you want people to talk to you. Someone just walked in. I, 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 yeah, no, come on. Hello, Jason. Oh no, I, not you! I heard, I heard your accent. Your your French accent is very good. Yeah. Well, thank thank you, uh, uh, Michelle. It's Michelle Palais. Of course, you know me as running the Palais app for people who believes in the truth. Yeah, weren't you supposed to? Wasn't Candace Owen supposed to buy your app or something, and it didn't happen? 
Oh, Candy Owens. I love her in a Murphy Brown. Murphy Brown, great show on television. I no? don't. I, no? You know what? Never mind. No, that's Candace. Candace Owens. Not a fan. Not a fan. Murphy Brown. She she tell Dan Quayle about potato. No? She was having a baby at a wedlock. I don't think we should be listening to her. Mm, Jason, I see your opinion. It makes me think you should come back to Palais. You had a great run on Palais. You had millions of followers. Including you, know, you know, Michelle? Candace, including Candice Bergen. I've been thinking about taking a hard right turn because that seems to be where the money is. You know what? Yes. You and I will talk later. Yes, okay, Jason. I leave my I leave my details, and uh, of course, we talk about blood cabal, etc. I will be over here. All right. Well, I, I, uh, I don't I don't like, I don't like how this is going, Jason. I I thought you were one of the good ones. Well, I am, but you know what? I also need money, and there's so much money to be made by being a right wing grifter, Jim. You gotta understand. I'm not a movie star, bud. I was I'm, I wasn't in uh, Vertigo, you know. Uh, uh, listen, Jason. Maybe I could also talk with you over here with with this with this uh, French weirdo here, this frog, and maybe I can try to convince you to go the other way. You know, you know, I do respect your counsel, Jim. So if you go over there with Michelle, wait there. I'm just gonna wrap this up, and then we will we will all have a chat. Okay, I'll go over there. <laughs> I I killed them. Oh. I immediately Shit. killed him. I I could I couldn't I couldn't I couldn't take it. I didn't I didn't realize you were armed. I I thought we had oh, I thought we had yeah. talked about this, Jim. I didn't. I said we don't really appreciate you bringing a pistol. I mean, nightstick's fine. Even a taser, we were cool with. But oh, don't worry, Jason. I am okay. He just shot me in the kneecap. Uh, that means I get to stay here forever. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, I guess he's with us forever now. I guess he is. Well, why don't you guys go stand over there, and we got to end this bloody podcast, Brennan? Uh, me? Oh, sorry, I was in the I was in the can. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so you know, do stuff. What? Yeah, what do are we stuff. doing? That's our do stuff. That's our motto over here for screening country. Do stuff, fuck shit up, and eat shit <laughs> for screening country. I'm Brendan, yeah. <laughs> and I'm Jason. Good night. Peace. <laughs> Screen and Country was created by and stars Brendan Wall and Jason McLeod. Today's film was 2006's Days of Glory, directed by Rashid Boucheret. Le Chant des Africains and Algerie Francais served as this week's music. This has been an Age of Radio production, copyright 2024. <laughs> Pour la vie, le ciel est plus bleu et nos cœurs joyeux chantent chaude la Marseillaise de fondre d'espoir des esprits sages, Algérie française.